like you know, like soccer, play by play commentary is no longer. And one of the things that um, was said was was that um, where a human being um, goes partly psychological, and that you know, it's it's about you know, discovering you know the patterns that might be used. And so when the guy who was playing Go who lost, what he said was going in that the computer really won't be able to do that for quite a while yet. And as he, when he, the game was finished and he lost, he said he never, where going in, he thought that the chance of the computer winning might, it might, out of you know, five different ones, it might win one game, okay? After this game, he said that um, there's a 50-50 chance that he can win. Only a 50-50 chance, and he said, what shocked him was, was that the artificial intelligence made a very serious but common mistake that everybody makes when they learn to play Go right at the beginning. But what's weird is the computer was a rabbit. It just kept playing and then he resigned early because the computer made a, 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 a Go maneuver that he had never seen that was so radical different that he did not believe it could be done. And It's internal analytics predict hours before the end of the game that it was, it was going to win. I guess the Google like execs were um, already very on the phone and very pleased sharing the news. So because that's a big, it was a big deal. Big deal. And right. the, this was one of those things where moment to moment, things that we say 10 years out, 15 years out, 20 years out, you have these milestones where suddenly, which Go was probably one of those that we said five to eight years out, and it's fallen already. What that means is that this intelligence can be applied across the board now that it works. And so one of the challenges we have is, is trying to predict this, and that's the reason why we're having the conversation, is, is to help you understand that you're gonna have to read about this and constantly change the markers, you know, for different pieces of this. Can we go step on to the slides? Go for it, yeah, absolutely. So um, as we were just discussing, it's a to the humans as of now in this timeline seems to be narrowing. So the AI seems to be taking more and more uh, control because they're proving more and more capable and surprising us by doing so. So some proposed solutions um, to the situation we have described here, which is essentially we're going to be displaced out of jobs. Um, not only automation not, does not only mean that the jobs are going to change in nature, but also there are less and less jobs. So the ending here is that uh, we may actually not need humans to do any work because the robots are capable of doing the work that we do today and further they're able to do it better than us, faster and cheaper. How can we protect ourselves as humans at this time? Um, some of the um, solutions that Ed and I discovered and we may speak to which ones we particularly feel are strong ones versus not so strong. Um, some education and work arrangements that can help uh, levering, le leveraging uh, working arrangements and uh, ver their various online platform, platforms for talent where you can get a job, uh, you know, people in India can get, get jobs and so forth. But the problem with this kind of setup uh, is that this is a sharing um, economy job. You don't get benefits, um, you don't have leave, uh, you don't get even a contract, so you're really working for a day to day and this is all you have. Um, there's an article on MSNBC Day. And what it said was is the destruction of the sharing economy. So artificial intelligence is going to kill off the sharing economy. You just heard that this is one of the responses um, to this challenge. And what's going on is is basically um, this company was saying that um, there's this misunderstanding <coughs> of the impacts of AI. They say many people talk about it taking a lot of blue collar jobs you know, the high quality, well-educated people. And uh, this was actually produced by a company that provides this kind of sharing economy, but for accountants, <coughs> for lawyers, for what are called high value, high skill engineers working in temp jobs. And what they said was, was that um, it'll probably destroy <coughs> those jobs. Accountants gonna disappear. The, the, and punches lower artificial intelligence. So one, one of the things that you've got to see 
and understand is they said that we had this argument about what's called high touch. In other words, if it requires a human being, you could do it with a robot, but it was probably a little more efficient to do it with a human being, you know, because like a garbage truck can handle the weight of a battery. It's real solid AI, so we can think of a garbage can. The human being, because of the way garbage cans are placed in the street and where they are, the human being actually is a little bit better at it simply because it doesn't have to do all the analysis work. Even though you could actually put the truck can handle the battery, the challenge is having enough electricity to run the artificial intelligence to do the work. So a garbage truck can handle tons of weights and lots of batteries. But the thing is you probably won't see that because the human being can actually do it more efficiently. So they added one thing to that. What they did is they said high social value. And what this means is, is like young children can't be taught by robots because there's a social interaction, a set of patterns and things, and you're constantly, so things that need what's, what are called social intelligence, those are jobs that are added to this sort of high touch. So in the previous one that we did downstairs in the library, I mentioned um, high touch because it was a reoccurring thing on, by a number of analysts. The social intelligence thing was something that I newly read about, and I hadn't really applied it you know, to a high degree. Um, so jobs that require social intelligence may have some lasting value that we hadn't thought about before. You know, in, in higher education, the social value may not be as valuable, but with young children, high social value becomes important. So there's a component of this that we don't understand completely yet. Um, at the same time, um, I, again, I, I didn't watch come up with an API for emotions. So if you want to make your robot more emotional, you can get an API and then plug it in and make it work. So we have some other uh, points here. We're thinking education system. We are thinking about this. Um, and uh, Ed and I put together a little list of five areas that are specifically for our group, which is IT professionals. So let me share this with you briefly. Do you want to import this? Um, it's, on, it's, not, it's on the browser. It's for me. I said it up here. So these are four areas where five areas, sorry, where we think that so far in the narrow term, in the near term, uh, we our college can provide some uh, job openings for students and some employment. Um, but we need to also make mention uh, here that we think that a long term solution is going to have to include some high level policy and it's going to involve more decision making than what we can do here. So the five areas that um, Ed and I think are still a good investment for your time to study are tools and thing development. In other words, using a framework such as Bootstrap or WordPress or Drupal, there's uh, some very specialized skills um, that you need to know. And you can put them together. You still have to know problem solving skills. You have to have problem solving skills, system analysis. But these jobs, probably for now, will be still available for you. There, uh, one way to sort of figure this out is the closer you are to the people portion of it, the more likely it is. Because the more likely it is, it, it'll continue to exist. It's harder to automate. It has to be things that we can automate. Like doctors have very high skill level, but they do things over and over and over. And so the doctors can be automated where a nurse really can't because they're very close to the human patient, if you will, but the doctor is more at a higher level of operations. This, so, yeah, this is it's really idea. important. The human, That's what you're the human factor, right. Yeah. Uh, model development, according to even the World Economic Forum, is one area that's going to continue to grow. So we have mentioned it here, we actually have to make a little advertisement. We do teach Android programming in spring quarter coming up if you wanted to sign up. The interesting thing about model development is that we don't know exactly what we need to teach in the very near future. So this technology is very rapidly changing. But if you want, if you're interested in model development, that still seems to be a sound area to focus. Yes, on. I agree completely. Now, one of the things that you have to keep in mind is there's some things that are going to radically make the world difficult for you as a developer. At an infrastructure level, what's going on is is we're creating closed gardens. A lot of people haven't really connected the dots yet. And I'm going to explain it to you. And then what's weird is it may take you months to think about it before it actually sort of clicks and you get the aha moment. Okay? So take, you know, give it's okay to sort of go, yes, but 
but think about it and read about articles and figure this out. So here you go. Ready? The world that's arriving is, is what's called account-centric. We have a number of things. So where in the past you may have logged into a computer system, like here at Seattle Central you have a student account. The world that's arriving means that you're in a closed garden. So you log into like a Windows computer here on the desktop, for instance, and you currently log into a Seattle Central account. And it has no mobility beyond this physical building. In fact, it may only be on that local device. The world that we are building now, and in particular this applies to Facebook. Now these are the big players. These are the ones that you're going to want to count on. These are the ones you follow. The big players are Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, Google. Who would I leave on? Apple. Apple has a device-centric view of the world. Okay? And unless they change the world, you notice that the new version of Windows, one of the things they did is they said, we are no longer using the model that Apple does. They left that world and they said that when you create a Windows 10, you install a Windows 10 operating system, you agree to use a account and it is not a local account on your computer. You create uh, a live account or a whatever account, and that, that account is good on five devices. Your information doesn't matter whether it is a, you know, a, a desktop computer, a notebook computer, a phone, a tablet, an Xbox, etc. Your account and everything you are is in the cloud. Okay. It's just like Google. And that. Yeah, it's, and they changed, it became Google. they became Google. And what they did is, they said, we're gonna keep all your information. And we're, our business model now is about selling your information. You agree exactly the way, everything that would make, that made Google and Facebook evil companies, Microsoft has now joined the company. Now you'll notice one thing that sets Google and, and Microsoft apart, they own their own search engines. Now the reason, why I put Facebook and I put Amazon in this camp is most people don't realize that Amazon has an extremely powerful search engine. It's used to figure out prices and products, right? Okay, and they are tied, because they have your shipping information and credit information, they know where you are on the planet. So when they sell that information to people, they know way more than Google does or Microsoft does, okay? Then you have Facebook, and Facebook has what's called pictures, facial recognition, and you'll notice that they have a tremendous amount of information and the way in which you connect with other people, okay? Because of your connections and your likes, your social graph, right? And so as a result, that is in fact another kind, if you will, of search engine. It's a little different model, okay? You'll notice that Apple does not own a search engine. When you use, you know, Anything on a, if you use Siri, for instance, you get Bing. If you use um, websites, you don't know what you're looking at, you typically get Google buried, okay? But what's going on here is that the world that's being created is about you as an entity decoupled from the physical devices. And so you'll notice that we don't talk about here cell phone development, we talk about mobile development or application development. So you'll notice that cell phones don't matter. It's mobility that matters. And so the platform going forward may in fact, and that's why wearables, all of this stuff is impacted by how much electricity you have for this mobile device. Be back on. So this is an important distinction. Uh, thanks for making that. Uh, a couple other areas to mention here. Data-centric programming, so as you probably are, have figured out already by the discussion, it's all about the data. And so if you know, um, if you have the skills to be a data scientist and to analyze data, this is going to um, give you uh, good employment for for the future. Long, very long time. Python is a great language to know. We do offer Python at the college as well. By the way, he posted this blog on the Seattle Center of Facebook, Seattle Center Web Design and Development, so if you want to do the entire blog in more detail, please go there. Um, and uh, AI programming, it's a, uh, this is a, uh, you know, <laughs> thank you. This is the part of um, 
the future that actually requires a lot of computer science and a lot of math. So these are maybe barriers for some of us. Uh, but, Masters, um, PhD levels, which is right. But the, uh, of course, we still need to program the AIs. And as I mentioned in my blog post, until they learn to program themselves, of course. Uh, and finally, last but not least, there's still a lot of legacy code out there, a lot of business objects. Yes, one. Yeah? Uh, as the name of the book again. Oh, yeah. yeah. You can um, see this is Artificial yeah. Intelligence, a Modern Approach okay. by Stuart Russell and uh, Peter Norvig. All right, thank you. you. You can see it on the way out. Um, awesome. Yeah. So um, there is still a lot of lexical, which means that um, a lot of companies are not willing to just go for the greatest and latest technology because they're vested. In fact, Cliff uh, Cruzov here was just mentioning that Fortran is still used for some of the airline automation. We even can have mainframe the jobs still available, although that's not what I'm referring to here. But a lot of smaller companies who have their own business processes coded in some business object model, and they're not ready to move on and someone needs to maintain those systems, right? Yeah, the, 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 what we're talking about here is a transition away from the third industrial age to the fourth industrial age. Fortran, um, uh, airlines, um, mining, a lot of these processes use very expensive equipment that cannot easily be thrown away. It's multi-million dollar. So until the processes evolve in such a way, many of the core industrial processes around the world will continue to use these legacy systems. It doesn't mean that there won't be some massive change. What will happen is, is the interface and the control, these analog muscle-based systems <coughs> use what's called SCADA 3. SCADA 4, and you go, what's SCADA? Mm -hmm. I never heard of it. How about this? Internet of Things. Internet of Things is the marketing name we shorten it in our program to IoT. <coughs> IoT, Internet of Things, is in fact, in fact, SCADA 4. This is digital control. And when you put digital controls on, it means you can put artificial intelligence in place. And so what will happen is you'll have a bifurcated economy. Those that will use the older legacy client-server model and those that transfer, because of the way the businesses operate, to IoT and the next in industrial age. So take Uber. Uber currently operates and it has people drivers. If you go on the Uber site, you'll discover that they are openly saying that their goal is, is to use self-driving cars and eliminate people. No surprise there. No surprise. But you'll notice that people aren't needed in that process. And to get to electrical-based systems, you can have a, set, a car, like your cell phone, many of us have these cell phones that you can put on a charging plate at home where you don't have to plug in the plate, you just lay it on the thing and pick it up and charge it automatically. Imagine the car drives into a parking slot at the Uber parking lot, it charges overnight, and then takes off during the day, or there's no bathroom breaks, no whatever. All right, so we wouldn't really think the education system, and we need to be lifelong workers, I think this is, a um, there's no brainer here. It's a little challenging to figure out how to make these changes with the education system because things are moving so fast. Uh, but I think we gave at least some ideas for our program, at least, that we have some near-term solutions that we presented to you. And we really need to look at uh, cross-industry industry and public-private collaborations more and more because the jobs are obviously coming from uh, private industry. Um, this is not working now, I think, since I... Side out of your Amazon account. Sure. It prefaces that that with um, not you. Yeah. Sign out. So the the implication, obviously, being that 
you would only sign out of an account if it wasn't yours. Like, but if it was yours, you would be signed in indefinitely. Like, can you explain sure. what they're doing there? Sure. The rationale is is that why would you log out? You would always be connected to Facebook 24 hours a day. Why would you want to leave Amazon and go to Facebook? The goal here is is that you will never leave Facebook. And so what you'll do is you'll talk to people and say, oh, you're not on Facebook. I don't associate with people who are on Facebook. I don't associate with people who are on, on Apple or on Microsoft Twitter. or on whatever on. <laughs> Twitter won't be around much longer. But, so they're um, trying to enhance their network effect? Or they're, they're trying to enhance um, the, like the power of their network like just through in, incentivizing people to, to use it all the time? Well, it, I mean, it, I showed you the Echo. Yeah. You'll notice there's a new version of the Echo, the mini Echo. Okay. The goal here is, is that you have a base station, you have an echo in every single room, why would you ever lock out? You would just say, you know, Alexa, you know, turn on the lights. Alexa, um, tell me the latest um, update on um, the votes in the Democratic, you know, um, primary and fill in the state, right? Yeah. Um, so the answer is, is that you would never, ever log out. And the problem with this is, is that human beings are lazy. You know, if you put a bowl full of chocolate in front of me, I'll probably eat the whole bowl of chocolate, right? And it's yes. not good for me, yeah. right? And so you can imagine what happens is when in knowledge and processes don't require human, a lot of human effort, and the artificial intelligence can do all the heavy lifting, it dumbs down people. Yeah. And so one of the things is unless you're very aware of the transition, you won't work hard to protect your job you know, skills. Suddenly one day robotics will arrive and you'll be unemployed and you won't have, you know, practice the tool sets you need to sort of retrain yourself. Part of what's going on here is, is that, you know, a degree in English, by and large worthless. You know, the computers will spell everything for you. You won't type. You'll, you know, you use voice. The computers will automatically set the syntax and correct you. Right? Mm -hmm. And It'll, it'll discover information that we talked about someone says, do you want to include this? Do you want to have to do any research? Do you want to have to think about it? It'll, it'll start to automatically build it up. So your ability to develop critical, strength, uh, critical thinking skills will shrink. And so, you know, no history degrees, no philosophy, no, you know, no psychology, none of those things. The practitioner side of psychology will continue to be important because that, that's that social function we talked about earlier and that high touch. Is very close to the end user, yeah. and so what you're looking at is basically, you know, if there are four people employed, you take half of those probably within ten years of being employed. But then you take that half of those people away. Look what it does to your tax base, yeah. and then what it does is those people are still employed because they're so critical to the computer systems. It's like where today someone who does X job in computers because we have so few people who can handle these systems. You know where you know today the company you know there's fair number of people, but as the computer systems become more integrated, what happens is those people that currently say, I don't know what the job skill is, say just for example, 40,000, you know, in 10 years they'll make 80, they'll make 80,000 or 200,000, because there just isn't the number of people. These people who are here in technology today will have grown up with this transition and understand what the moving parts are. Yeah, it's high, high, high school. Yeah, the diminished high tax base is then self so <laughs> the diminished tax base is trying to transform the education system. And it can't. It <laughs> money. So that's why we say the UBI within, say, 10 years, universal basic income, you know, sort of four years of free education, or free, you know, for things that Obama's talked about. You'll notice that, that Obama, you know, one of the kitchen cabinet members of Obama is um, the um, chief executive officer of Google. Larry. Um, yeah. No, 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 that's uh, the yeah, it's Schmidt, isn't it, Eric Schmidt? Eric Schmidt, yeah, that's yeah. right. And so he's he he was an early an early supporter of, of Obama and part of his kitchen cabinet. And you can see where some of um, those kinds of things pop out of Obama's mouth, because you know people who do this are pretty concerned about it. You notice that a lot of people say the sky is falling. You know, it's the people who know about this. It's Gates. It's you know, it's um, uh, test, um, Musk. Uh, Musk, Elon Musk. These are people who know about this and are pretty aware of what we can do. And the challenges are that no one is able to see what's going on in the labs. In other words, you didn't know about the Echo, 
until it arrived in the stores for Christmas. Amazon did not talk about it. The it surprise is companies. important. Huh? The surprise is important. Well, it's not so much the surprise important, it's competitive edge. Oh, you right. want your competitor to know what you're doing and then work on a competing product. That is, that is the surprise. Surprise to your competitor. Right. It's surprise to the competitor, yeah. So, so please continue. Well, I, I think the issue with the slides had to do with, uh, in any case, this is working out on Google. Well, why not? Why not? Why won't robotization also create jobs? I don't think we need to spend a lot of time. No, it won't, because you can automate essentially we see one more. So let's not even waste our time discussing. Many this people are. Many, many people say, well, someone's going to have to repair the robots. The robots will be have interchangeable parts. That's called autonomous computers. They can diagnose themselves and replace their parts and do anything else they need to do. They think people think of robots as if they're cars, they not even close. Right. So the old. World analogy is no longer home. Third industrial age analysis from people you have to question. And that's really a problem. Most people don't wear a sign that says, you know. So, <coughs> no way, it's unstoppable. There are some political actions that we, well, we, we can participate in, we can really drive the entire process. And the one in pink is the one that I think Ed and I feel like it's the most practically applicable and the most doable. There are issues with um, global technology tax, which is that you can get around the taxes around. by moving locations and so forth. And the same with the uh, regulation. But U uh, UBI, ex um, I guess, experiments have been done in various parts of the world. They seem to work pretty well. Um, if you give uh, people um, in Africa a sum of money instead of trying to go to the, some other process, they generally will spend it well on, you know, um, making their lives better or improving their business and so forth. So I think since there will be no jobs, that seems like the logical. Has it only been tested um, out in third world countries? No, uh, Denmark and some, maybe some others as well, but yeah, a lot uh, of places. Switzerland. Switzerland. Uh, a couple yeah. of weeks ago, they, they passed the law uh, for a certain uh, basic income that uh, the government should uh, give to everybody. It's pretty, I mean, the thing is, is that um, capitalists don't like it. Libertarians don't like it. The problem is, is that when you have people, when you have large portions of the population suddenly being forced to live in boxes, you know, you're looking at a riot level, you know, process, and it gets pretty easy to make these kinds of adjustments. Um, <coughs> the trick is, you don't want to have the gun to your head. You want to deal with it gradually. You want to be able to have the system support it. That's what kind of Sandy and I are saying. You know, if we go back into our communities and we start to say, you know, look, you know, this is not a joke. This is coming. There's no way to stop it. It's not a, you know, a lot of people in the past, when a new technology comes in, there's jobs created. Some are destroyed, some are created. We're talking about destroying jobs. The machines work 24 hours a day. You know, they don't have all the problems that human beings have. So there's no way to make it work. And again, I mentioned this last time, but it's important to have a more diverse group of people who are involved with these decision makings and with building AIs. Uh, because diverse groups have obviously diverse voices, so it's important to have that kind of um, voice what actively we're, to... Yeah. What we're saying is, is that Stanley, Stanley and I, you know, the things that we do this every day, and it's, to us it's very obvious. Even people who are in technology have a hard time understanding this and coping with it. And one of the things that we think is, is that you shouldn't leave this to technologists, because technologists, we love the coolness of it. You know, we're, we're likely to just do it because we can, and it's a puzzle, and we love tinkering, we love doing things, and because we can do it, it ought to be great for everybody. The things, a lot of stuff goes into this that maybe we aren't thinking about. And we are, I think, I think everyone in this room is technology, is technology, is technology is so. You're savvy. We, maybe that's why we're here, but it needs to be a bigger discussion in this room. We want you to go out and talk to your family members and whatever, and try to generate that conversation. Um. <clears throat> I, I know that uh, this person up here said something about the third world or the developing Marcus. world, yeah. Marcus. Yeah. And then, Stephen, you responded, Switzerland, this, that, and the other. And herein lies the problem. As you were saying, Ed, um, when you've got, oh, let's say, half or three quarters of the world unemployed, it goes beyond riot to, you know, permanent, uncontrollable chaos. And then you said, you know, so it becomes pretty easy to make the adjustments. Yes, indeed. 
when capitalism is sufficiently embattled by a cred credible force, it will move in the direction of human concerns just to maintain their system. It has nothing to do with being humane or caring about other. Oh, and they're not going to, and they're not going to want to pay for it. They want you know, they're going to poor folks to pay for it. And, well, and they're not gonna, obviously, they're not, not going to take their profits. But and that's and the thing is, it's not altruistic, you know. And you're right. But the thing is, is that the other we have good examples of when chaos arrives: Somalia, Libya, Syria, and you have large mass migrations and you know. It's nice to say you're going to deport people, but if you deport them, you know, people are going to, you know, cause problems. There's a lot of them, yeah. If you're going to have um, the workforce taken over by robots, who's going to be the customers? Exactly. There's no need for customers. Though. No need so, for customers. Now, so, now why, the why can you explain that? that nobody's using. Well, the thing is that you still have basic commodities that you need. In other words, you know, you need food, and you'll notice that the latest Ford tractor doesn't need a human operator. The latest Ford tractor in the past, tractors have come. So how are people going to be able, able to buy? How are people going to be able People aren't. So essentially, that's they the problem. They're poor. Right. So essentially, other than a few who own the robots who can produce everything they want to consume themselves, there is no need literally for anybody else. Everybody else so becomes, right. becomes lives in a box and doesn't right. consume. And there's the technical feudalism scenario that we. Then you're want right. It's really places. a problem. And that's why we believe that the universal basic income becomes important. And then what you can do is, if you include education with it, we can redefine the world and what it means to be a human being. And you know, where the machines take care of providing the food and the lights and the whatever it is, and then you know the rest of us, you know, you know, you know, as a teacher, I work on godly hours. Okay, you know, the thing is, imagine what I might do with my life if I only had to spend 20 hours a, 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 a month doing some kind of work and the rest of the time was available to me to explore, you know, the spiritual side of, of us or, the, or, or draw flowers or become a painter or whatever. It means that we're, the, whole, the human being will have time that it hasn't had in the past to think about things in a different way. But, I mean, that sounds like retirement then. Retirees frequently die soon after they don't have a job. Well, never. Um, are we at a point in the presentation where this discussion is appropriate, or do you have a lot more? Well, we have a lot more, but I think we are actually going to proceed in the more speculative part of the conversation and start talking about more longer term um, outcomes and poss possibilities. Um, so I think maybe we can touch upon this later. I guess what it's like an existential, existential question you're asking, Brent, which is, well, what if you know, what if we don't get work? Is there we any? We can't imagine. To we don't lives? know. That's a good open question. Um, I, I mean, we do know right. actually. I mean, this, it's not as if we've always lived under the yoke of capitalism. Human beings, for the vast portion of our development as humans, uh, did not live under capitalism. And what we know is that hunter and gatherer societies generally worked much fewer hours than we do, and they did things like create art and so on. I don't know if they work less hours than we do, but actually, they yes, they did. yes, okay. anthropological evidence strongly indicates that they worked significantly fewer hours. But what I don't know your name. I'm sorry, Brent. Brent, I am Deborah. What? See, the thing is, when you talk about, we won't need humans to do this work so we will redefine what it means to be human. That is not the issue it seems to me. We know what it is to be human. The question is, will the capitalists, that tiny, tiny fraction of the population that lives like so many vampires off of our work, do we have any force that can shove them aside and corral them? What I'm hearing here is, that somehow they will decide, this tiny group, that it's okay, we may be living in boxes, but they'll just leave us go. Why would they do that? Why would they even bother? To do something about it? Why, why not just the, you know, let us all die out from disease or whatever while they live in their gated well, communities? Well, libertarians, you would say that that's accurate. 
But I, I, what I, the only thing I would put forward is, is there is no answer. I think in a moment we're going to show you some things, some speculative things that may color this conversation a little bit. But I can say that um, that capitalists will, you know, the only way that the robots arrive is because of capitalism, because their goal is is to eliminate the labor portion of their costs. And when you concentrate that much wealth, wealth per se, if people are riding and break the the robotic infrastructure that allows that to, to happen, it can imperil their existence. And the capitalists will respond to the possible impairment by saying, we're going to give you a universal basic income. It allows us, we're going to redistribute a small more portion of the cash we bring in because ultimately it's good business like Ford. If I pay people a larger salary, I'll have enough money to be able to finance, and then I can use tricks. You, you know what I'm talking about. That I do, argument. but... The so the argument is is that whether the capitalists will, re will release any portion of their income to sort of ward off um, techno-feudalism. We don't have the answer to that. No, no, and, Even and feudalism was based upon the peasantry working and producing necessary so goods. And I think what... Brent may be pointing to is, okay, if you've got all these robots and whatnot, they're mining, they're refining, they're smelting, blah, blah, blah. What are humans needed for at all by the capitalists? Maybe they're not. That's one of the That's possible That's one of the people without consumers, they're not going to have. They don't need consumers they don't need because consumers. they just need to produce what they're going to consume the themselves. Right. Have you seen the movie Elysium? Yeah. It's close to the So we have a few hands, right? Hey, so I think, what are you, sorry. Yeah. Just a quick question, are you happy yeah. to for the EBI? No, we're saying that it seems to us, of all the things that we've seen proposed, um, to answer this question, when you unemploy large numbers here, it seems to be one of the few ones out there that, like the global tax, I mean, Stani and I have seen examples of, say, Apple, right? People say, you know, Apple has this all the money they made in a foreign country. You know, they're, you know, they ought to be forced to bring back, you know, sort of the Bernie Sanders argument, you know, these companies are exporting all this stuff, right? Well, the answer is to Bernie Sanders is you sit there and say, okay, okay, Apple makes their products in, in Korea, you know, in, in Asia. So all the parts that they buy are all, you know, made in Asia. So it's is, is actually Apple, because the product was made mostly in Asia, is it an Asian company rather than an American company? But then you sit there and you say, well, the money, the stocks, if you look at the amount of stock that's owned by it, and I don't know exactly where it was, but three or four years ago when I looked at it, something like 80% of Apple was owned by the Sovereign Fund of Saudi Arabia. It was, an, it was a Saudi Arabian company. It wasn't an American company. But the thing is, is that most of the employees are in fact based in Cupertino, California. So the people who, who make the products, who design the products, not you know, make the glass, make the things, right? So is it a Saudi company, is it an American company, is it a Korean company? And so you have some questions about capitalism, and so I don't know. You know, it, it is hard to sort of say a global tax would work. We don't think so because there's so many ways to get around those issues. You know, it's nice to have politicians like Bernie Sanders saying things, but you sort of look at Bernie and you sort of do the numbers and you look at the what the, what the economists say, and you sit there and go, Bernie Sanders, can say anything he wants, it's sort of like saying chicken every pot, but he really doesn't have a place to go with it simply if you look at under the skin a little bit. And it's not, I mean, that doesn't mean that Bernie Sanders is saying really valuable things. I'm just saying that if you sit there and say, let's actualize some of the things he's doing, there's some things going on that may make that a challenge. And so trying to look forward to this, all we can sit there and say is we see these trends, let's have the conversation, let's make sure that it doesn't get done to us. At least let's talk about it and sort of say maybe how do we respond or what to think about it. The more I look into UBI, the more it seems like that's the logical, rational way to approach. So it's about the only thing that we can see that think we get, might be. Do you have a follow-up question? Uh, I read that uh, this system actually works uh, pretty well in countries uh, with uh, a large aging uh, uh, society with uh, with a lot of uh, retirement people where the length of life is uh, is really long and they always say Japan, Japan. Uh, uh, because now uh, now uh, uh, soon uh, soon in Japan uh, the number of retired people 
uh, would be bigger than the number of, uh, of the people who, are, who actually work. Uh, so uh, if, uh, if robotics uh, uh, came, uh, uh, comes into, into life in, uh, in Japan, it, it would uh, really help uh, the government to, to keep and pay uh, the retirement of all, all those retired people. They are not. Yeah, uh, Japan uh, is yeah, not. Yeah, so uh, uh, Japan is a uh, very good example where it, it will work very, very well, but in, in other countries uh, where there are uh, more of young people who, who would like to work, and they, they probably wouldn't have the possibility to work in, in their entire life. Right. That's a good point. Yeah, Brazil, Argentina. Uh, okay, the, uh, let's say Brazil and Argentina. They, they still have some good uh, educational system, probably. But uh, think about the countries where the where people they, they cannot get e even education. They are for life out DRC out of the market. Yeah, so, so that. I'd like to make a comment, if I may, and it's not really an invitation to change the discussion, but it has a little bit to do with Japan. In Japan, you have a lot of ancestor worship and a lot of uh, respect for your elders. And uh, so you do have to take care of your family. Uh, you know, it's a personal belief. Now, I think about, um, you know, for instance, sort of like anthropology, you look at the Shoshone, Units in the Great Basin. For thousands of years, they lived there, their families, and they survived on barely anything eating, you know, uh, insects, reptiles, uh, seeds, stuff like that. And they survived for thousands of years. They uh, encapsulated their religion to their family, uh, their education was within the family. All those things were in the family. What we become now, so we have institutionalized religion, uh, institutionalized education, and I get a feeling like this is a, another type of institutionalization going on. But I just, I just right wanted to comment. Right? No, I don't agree. It's a call of the Yeah, I don't think there's any argument. Um, but, I, but I think of that trend, and I think are we swept up in a solar wind? that is blowing along and taking us there, it may take us further. I mean, how far do you go with robotics to where you're using, uh, um, you know, chemical or, like, DNA methods? Coming up. Let's Coming go up. Let's, let's <laughs> go on with some more charts. Let's go on with some more okay, so, so far we were still talking about near term, and I think from this point on we're going to talk about some longer term implications of the same discussion. And uh, again, so this is informed speculation, so please, Say what argue. your view is and argue with it. But one of the first questions, well, one of the next questions, maybe we need to ask them as well. Don't robots have rights? And I guess some of you probably saw um, the movie Ex Machina. This, uh, this is actually from it. So, what do you think? So, so, is it even ethical for us to talk about discriminating against robots? I mean, you know, they may be just the next evolution, and actually they are. So, should we be discriminating against them or just let them continue as they're doing? What do you think? Well, there again, you're, you know, it's that institutionalization, how you your paradigm, how you look at the world and make sense right. of it. So if you define it that way, yeah. If you define it differently, then no. Well, you defined it up there, not a sentient being. This yeah, what you find what a sentient the question being is, is you, haven't, you haven't made a determination of what you consider sentient. That's and right, then you're also talking about something ethical for something that is artificial. We're not talking about like a group of people who develop that who develop orga organically in a specific geographic location or something. We're not talking about that. We're talking about an idea that started in the mind of someone, generally for profit, to create something for themselves. And now we're trying to say, hey, can we attach some kind of human social construct around this? so that we can help to foster this idea forward and push it on people who will say no. Does it, does it necessarily have to have a profit? No, I mean, he's just saying that's the source. Well, yeah. what I would just where it's coming from. That's where yeah. it came from. Yeah, what, I would say, what I would say is, is that we're putting it in human terms. Be careful because 
the machines that are being created, it came from my mind, you know, so like I, I have children, right? And I inform their minds and, you know, we talk about family values, so, you know, I try to encourage my child to do one way versus another. What if I created a computer and I try to encourage it to go one way and not the other? So I've created, an, a, 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 and if the being at some point starts to respond and sort of function by itself, so I've created it. So it's an extension of me, maybe not biological, but it's an extension of my mind, all right? And it decides to exterminate all of you. Well, you know, remember it's survival of fittest, so unless you have an artificial, in, you know, what I would call an artificial intelligence, to, to push back against my sentient being, you know, so maybe the goal is, is that we're basically treated like ants and we've created a replacement. You know, we, we kill ants, you know, with the sprays and stuff, right? So because the artificial just because they're right. with us. They're, they're, they're too small. Yeah. Right. yeah, I mean, Another slide. Um, next slide. So <coughs> I think this is a good baseline, but it's a very, at the same time, how do you define sentient, right? Are we almost sentient? Or how, mu how much of our lives are we actually sentient? So we can think about this as well. And that brings us to the um, topic of transhumanism. So how many of you have heard this word before? All right, let's talk about it. So this is the stuff that I personally get pretty excited about. Um, so what is transhumanism? Well, uh, this is a the group of people who identify themselves, or I should say transhumanists, identify themselves as people who believe that we can, show them, can, we can and should improve the human condition by the use of advanced technology such as genetic engineering, nanotech, cloning, just anything new that comes up, we might as well um, improve ourselves because a human being is a, we are obviously a process of evolution, but we are also a work that hasn't, we haven't reached the end yet, so it's too evolving. So a couple, um, it's also I should mention here that transhumanists are very interested in life extension, so you can start asking yourself, do you actually want to live forever? Is this a possibility? Why not? Why not? I, I think, why not, right? Um, and should we be boosting our intellectual, physical, and psychological capabilities uh, so that we are more advanced? So maybe I'll just pause here. Can I say it's a different form, not necessarily advanced? A different form, right? But essentially, you can design yourself to be whatever you want to be. So this is the idea of trans See, I, see I, I've heard that cockroaches, when the nuclear bomb, the zombie attack comes, Cockroach is the only thing they're really going to live, so I'd like to come back as a cockroach. <laughs> <laughs> a very long-lived cockroach. Right? It's a safe bet. Yeah. Okay. I just shoot for the. We can probably do better than that. Yes, guys. What's happening though um, is that people people are assessing the goodness of a transhumanistic reality um, using the criteria that we've established for the goodness of life today, without considering how. Uh, different and novel criteria for evaluating the goodness of life would emerge from being beyond human. Actually, that's a great point, and some, a few are actually thinking about this, um, maybe not many. Uh, one interesting idea is that when the eyes evolve, their goal is not going to be survival of the fittest anymore. In fact, there is some evidence I was just sharing that our evolutionary goals may have already changed, so because we generally are taken care of, our main driver for evolution now is uh, to be in a group, which is why Facebook, for example, is so popular. So group uh, dynamics is what drives us today. And in other words- Are you it, saying it didn't used to drive us? Well, it not only used to drive us, but it's essential for us to be, but um, in the past, one can argue there was more need for us to focus on surviving. So we had to put our own energy to survive, whereas uh, today, we have more luxury as far as survival, and we can focus on more on the group dynamics. That's just something I read, so I'm not advocating for it. But the reason I'm bringing it up is that it may be that uh, transhumanists or AIs, more evolved AIs, may have different priorities than you know survival. They may just thrive on complexity, or of course something we can't even figure out yet, just because we don't understand uh, what's going to be coming up next. Yes, Deborah. The wealth of things to comment on. Let's just stick with the first, last line of the first paragraph. Anybody who's focused on transhumanism need only reflect on this. 
This is how the technology is used by the underlying U.S. military to kill other humans. That's what they use it for. Now, of course, there's there's nothing in the technology that requires it to be this used for right. evil. Right. There's no requirement for this to be There is no that. requirement except the entire system out of which the technology is born. Therefore, the issue is not the technology, for good or ill. The question is when are we, as humans, going to step forward and take control the only way to do that is by overthrowing capitalism. Or we could continue to put our faith in the people who bring us really quick thinking snipers. It's difficult to decide for it to us to change because there's nothing that really proved that could be better. Yeah. For, for now. This is the problem, using our human brains to figure out a very complex problem. That's the problem. Which is exactly why we need AI, because only AI is going to be smart enough to figure out the most complex, the most difficult. AI is never going to be smarter than people who actually design them for Our brains aren't that big. We need something that can go much, much faster than we can. It's already being shown to be true in everything we're doing in high science. Everything. Physics, cosmology, astronomy, everything. We are totally dependent upon machines that are faster than us and capable of crunching data faster than we are. Great. We need that. I put forward my belief system. You put forward yours. We're even. But it's not a belief system. Our existence depends upon it. This won't happen without a smart machine bringing it to us. Well, actually, this is here now, and it wasn't smart machines that brought it here. It was us that brought it here. Originally. Originally. Well, indeed, yes. Yeah, but we've gone past that. We've left. Oh, that. have we indeed? Let's go over to Syria and figure that out. <laughs> well, okay, okay, not worldwide. That's true. Not okay. worldwide. Okay. Okay. Not worldwide. Right over here. Yeah. I got it. You know, I keep thinking in my head, and again, this is not an invitation of the discussion of something else, but the Roman lead pipe syndrome. And, uh, the, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, it, is this to make us live longer or live forever, whatever, that, that kind of idea? I mean, what happens in a petri dish when you have, you know, the, the organism spraying out, it boots itself, kills itself off? What do we say about, you know, animal populations, that we need wolves to keep down this population so the other ones don't overgraze and starve? And you have, you know, if you got too many elk, you know, they, they die of starvation because they overgraze or just use it. And so we run out, you know, we got resource. And we got to think about, well, our resources, you know, and I know that's why we do some exploration in space, to bring resources back. So, but, but okay. you know, those so, things. So, so understand the you know, biological systems and a machine system that doesn't work doesn't require biological things to exist, we'll make decisions that may say, well, you know, we're going to send you a ticket in the mail and you're supposed to, you know, turn up at the extermination point because you've been determined to be excess, you know, for the planet. And so instead of there being a wolf to kill you, you know, it's an, it's an artificial intelligence that says the goal here is to maximize, you know, it's a spark the, society. The, no, I'm just saying that the artificial intelligence may look at the whole thing and may draw on all these elements and say these portions are not needed and so it will make a rep like in that Still go is. champions the go champion said he had never seen that move he had never believed that it could be done when it was done he resigned the game immediately because he could look at all the scenarios and he could not see a win a way to win from that point and so the artificial intelligence might say at one point, you know, it's obvious, and I know that you human beings don't like to say it, but actually we really don't need a lot of it. And um, I guess so, some of this is speculation, but I would say this is a fact that if technology enables something to happen, it has never been stopped due to ethical consideration. So that just doesn't happen. Just, uh, I the guess sniper example. The sniper example or any other example. If something is technically feasible, it will happen. And just because somebody doesn't think it's ethically sound or morally appropriate, that's not going to be a stop to it. It's just is how history has shown. 
with yeah. human beings and all. Uh, if you're not familiar with the CRISPR technology, this is a technology for gene editing. And actually, I would like to make an interesting point here. So transhumanism in AI, we can think about it in two different ways. One of them is if we can enhance our biological selves. So with CRISPR, we'll be enhancing our genes. But there is also an argument to make that our biological bodies are not actually quite that great to begin with. So we might as well just look at uploading to a computer or getting Android bodies. And those are two different ways that you can go about this transhumanist problem or issue, um, including mind aborting. And uh, mind aborting is very interesting to me personally. So the, the big question would be if you upload your mind, let's say that it was figured out how to do it, you upload your mind to a computer, well, is it you then? So how many of you think it's you? How many of you think it's a copy of you? And do you copy. think you that? Copy? <laughs> I'm inclined to think it's a copy. I think it's copy, programmatically speaking, anyway. Um, I think it's fine. actually. You want it to be right? I don't want it to be me too. But I think it depends. Well, there's on the it creates it creates an elegant kind of recursive structure where uh, the like your brain by being aware of the copy of your brain, if you are aware, um, like has contains like uh, contains because like all of our brains contain kind of. Uh, denatured copies of the universe inside them because like we all form models of the world like that's why like that that informs like all of our behavior and our logical decision making so the 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 model of the world that's in your brain contains the the copy of your brain that's in this other thing um, knowing that it also has a model of the brain that contains your brain that has a model of the world that contains it so I, so I think that the question of whether it's like it's a, it's a discussion about the semantics of being identical to something or being a replica, and I think that it ceases to be uh, that distinction doesn't actually it, it's not it doesn't strike me as a particularly relevant distinction. Like you just have you have two identical mathematical structures, like you have two like. So, like, what's the importance of asking whether it is you or it's a copy of you? If it's me, and I'm going to follow my brain, and I want to know if the other entity is me. And um, what you're saying is very interesting, but you have to remember that we also have the context. So we have memories, which immediately, when you split the two, they change. And even the process of uploading takes time. So a change has already occurred. During that time, already there is a division between the you and the one that's being uploaded. I don't think it's quite that straightforward, but the model idea and the recursively containing models of itself is very interesting. interesting. Yeah. yeah, I just thought it was an observation. No, it's a very interesting one. Yeah. Okay, let's see. We have some other interesting um, topics here. So finally, we I think let me just clarify. Narrow AI, we refer to narrow AI as robots and machines who can do a specialized task. And AGIs are the general intelligence machine, artificial gen uh, Yes, what is the G for? General, or artificial oh. general intelligence. Okay. So we call them also super intelligent machines, and let's talk a little bit about that. First question I would like to, we would like to bring up is how likely, and I would like to read you this quote from Sam Harris. We need to only continue to produce better computers, which we will, unless we destroy ourselves or meet our end some other way. We already know that it is possible for mere matter to acquire general intelligence the ability to learn new concepts and employ them in unfamiliar contexts because the 1200 cc of salty porridge inside our heads has managed it, so there is no reason to believe that a, a suitably advanced digital computer couldn't do the same. I think a lot of people who are in this field seem to think that there is no issue with AGI happening. Is anybody in a different, in a different view discussed? All right. No, because the the brain is finite. It, it's of finite complexity. It's just a very, very high complexity. Yes. That's right. Sam Harris is also the guy that doesn't believe in free will, so it, that might be a good idea <laughs> to mention that. That's why a lot of philosophers these days do not believe in free will. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Another interesting point is that Sam Harris suggests that AGI can be used to 
the other interesting point to mention here is um, what is the we have been talking as if everything is going to go perfectly well, which it doesn't. So what is the chance of a human error? What might be the impact? We talked about these secretive labs where people are doing stuff. So picture ten young men in a room, several of them with undiagnosed Asperger's, drinking Red Bull and wondering whether to flip a switch. Should any single company or research group be able to decide the fate of humanity? The question nearly answers itself. Right. So that's a big risk. And the thing I would like to point out is that Echo arrived with no warning. That's right. You know, and this is, you know, every single one of these companies, the ones that matter are the four that I mentioned. Apple may or may not redefine the way it operates, but currently, the four that matter are the one that I, I mentioned. And those guys are competing at extraordinary rates. Microsoft is known for not like buying a lot of companies and developing a lot of technology themselves and trying to protect a narrow monopoly. The most in the last year it bought more companies than anybody else. The old rule was Google. Take a look at Google's purchase. And what you'll notice is, is that Google stopped about five years ago buying companies that deal with search engines and started buying exclusively artificial intelligence one. That's now seven years old. Nothing. The companies they bought were only artificial intelligence. And it shows you the investment in their thinking. Now, one of these companies believes that this isn't the battleground. They don't think that they will exist unless they win this game. Or they can just make a bug, introduce a bug in their program. So, David? Um, I've heard a very current one. Who is John Von Neumann? Uh, John Von Neumann is a famous mathematician who was um, worked, I think, in the 50s. Okay. And he was, um, he's a mathematician, okay. a pioneer of math and a lot of the computer theory. Encryption, encryption. And encryption, and he was um, actually the man who term, who coined the term, the singularity. Yeah. Which then, uh, Ray Kurzweil, who is a very famous uh, futurist now employed by Google, by the way, um, wrote a book, The Singularity is Near, you might be interested to read this book if you haven't already. And so, um, what is the singularity? Well, it is, you're probably familiar from physics with a black hole, which is the, at the point, at the event horizon of a black hole, the laws of physics, as we know, they break down, we don't know what happens. So, a digital black hole is the uh, singularity. In other words, the singularity is going to exponentially go to a point where it's beyond human comprehension, and that point- In other words, it may there, exist, and we wouldn't even be able to see it. It would exist right. in various places, would move itself around, and we would never know it that it was that we were living with it because it may may or may not choose to re, you know reveal itself. But I mean, in fact, that may exist right, right. now. Right. <laughs> Strictly speaking, so you can't be so sure that this isn't the it's reality. Like uniqueness, right? It's uniqueness, like nothing else. It's unique and it's also unpredictable and it's unmanageable by the normal laws that we that operate the world as we know it today. And one of the reasons for this is because we are human beings and we have evolved to be, for, you know, for survival in a flat, flat environment with middle side, our brains are a certain size, we are talking things, about linearity. Right? And we're linear thinking, thinkers. So exponential processes just don't track well with us. What about machine motivation? I mean, what is that? The, um, the motivation of machines, why are they going to want to increase? Why are they going to launch anything? How are they going to Their launch? initial conditions will be set in such a way that they will, without there being, without there being a, an actual reason. They, so in other words, it's from my their child. perspective. So I built yes. it in my model that the, once it becomes intelligent, it decouples like your child grows up and decides to become something, you know, you give them so quote unquote family values, and then those family values go haywire or get reinforced or do whatever. And the, and the child decouples from their parents and they become whatever they become. And decouples in this case with the exponential rate. So in other words, again, we come, we're speculating big time here because it's unpredictable. No, we know. It does seem that the same way we have evolved with certain you know, baggage from our predecessors, there may be some of this into the AIs as well. However, because they're exponentially growing, they may shed this uh, very rapidly. Deborah and this. I was out for a second, so I may have missed this. Um, originally, we were talking about some of the ways in which this coming and un currently unfolding technological evolution is affecting us, and most specifically, us as faculty and as students. So I'm curious as to the motivation, for example, for, for this. Is it um, 
uh, how does this fit in? What's the motivation for this? Real these? simple, 25 years. Yeah, it's just a time the number, The number that most of the people that we were talking about here believe that this arrives, this slide arrives in 25 years. Yeah. And because yeah, it was in 2040. Yeah, so we're what you have to do is, for a gray-haired person like me, I may or may not be around on the planet, but most of you in this room who have a 40 or 50 year working life, you may be looking at it in 24 years, you got nothing to do except what he describes, he says, people retire and they tend to die because they don't got work. And my grandfather was, he, he would retire. And he'd immediately go back to work because he says, I'm bored, right? And he would start a new company, right? And so he'd start company after company, because he would love retirement for about two weeks and then give up. We don't know what that world defined, but imagine when the whole freaking planet is in that boat. With but these guys but we won't be. Because even when your your grandfather or whatever retired, Damn. there was there was a whole world which as y'all are describing it, there would be there would literally be no point in any of us. Well, we don't know that. I think my main one, what I would like to convey the most here is that um, the near-term discussion we had seems pretty solidly based in our research, so we yeah, we're that's really confident. You are we're pretty confident about it, but uh, we're confident that something like the singularity in AGI is coming. We don't really know how this is going to play out because we don't understand when machines become super intelligent, super intelligent, <coughs> what kind of decisions they're going to make. So we're speculating a little bit, but it might be that they decide to keep us. It might be that the singularity is here already, we just don't know. Or the same way we have animals in the zoo, maybe we'll be pets. I mean, there are a lot of different ways. It doesn't mean we'll be gone. What the, reason why we're, the reason why we're saying this is, is that the number is 25 years. But the problem is, we keep getting surprised. Stani and I, we, we started this, what, four months ago, right? Four months ago, and we were concerned about you know our programs and you know yeah it's a, um, so we were really concerned and we started to sit there and we say we got to think about this. I was on the engineering side and the plumbing side, she was on the coding side, and we really wanted to think about this. And ever since we started these slides, we have to keep changing at an incredible rate because everything we thought was kind of like in the zone and right on the mark would get undone. And the thing that undone, undone us, like, just yesterday or today, was the go thing. The go thing was very big. And that's a, I mean, you, ha you don't understand that that is like a huge milestone. Maybe some, maybe That moves us so much closer that. to that Maybe we do years. know that. I mean, I do know that. I get that. I am questioning earlier assumptions. But, okay. What are the assumptions, though? Well, y'all know. I mean, okay. I stated well, them earlier. Well, your question is the solution setting, it sounds like. The things that we think might be reasonable things for people to do, I mean, you know, at, from a career perspective, it, you know, <laughs> you'll they're notice. Sort of, they're sort of silly in a certain sense. In this way, you know, uh, we have dozens and dozens of students. Just a tiny, you know, one or two of them will be able to reach any of these upper echelons, if that. What? Well, well, uh, no? No? Sure. Okay. Yeah, no. They can, we already are covering at least three, I think. Yeah. Three out of five we're covering. Data science and AI may be out of reach for so you're, of us. So you're saying within, so this is what I'm trying to come back to. But Deborah's talking about college educated people. She's not even discussing the people who haven't made it as far as the students in this college. Oh yeah, no. So we're well, there's that. Pretty much done. There's they're, that. They're done. And no, the point yeah. is, is that if you look at this college, the way the current educational system works in this college, look around this room, you'll be employed. You understand it. You're curious, you're worried about it, you're thinking about it. Most of the people here, I mean, and it, you can even sit in a web development class, you can sit in a coding class, you can sit in an engineering class. I've sat there and I've explained this to people and people sit there and go, you know, and they come to me and they sit there and say, oh my God, I finally got it. I finally got it. It made sense. And that's what we're trying to say to you is, is that you're going to think about this and you're going to come to your view of what this is a month, a week, two months, three months, and you're going to see these articles. And the thing is, is that I wrote about this and I called it Next Wave Technology a year and a half ago. And I wrote an email out and I sent it out to people and I said, we, and that was 
you know, at the beginning of the fourth, wave, and I'm, I got the new next wave. I called the next wave, and I tried to explain. I said we have to start thinking about this now and redefining the college and redefining the way we work with our students, the kinds of courses, and the way we set you know credentials and all these things. And I got crickets. I got four or five people who sat there and said, "Yeah, it's important, but I don't know how to do that. It's not possible." We got something worse than crickets as well. Well, it, well when, when we didn't get a response, Deborah and I went to the Board of Trustees and we said, look, pay attention. And then both Deborah and I got slapped on our wrists and we got told. A little bit tough. worse than that. Yeah, we got told yeah. not to participate. But the point is, is, that it, is that it is challenging for people when you say the emperor has no clothes. And they're not very comfortable with it. And what we're doing here is we're saying, you know, this is what people who are way more informed than we are are saying 25 years. And now we're saying it to you and we're saying, this is one of those things where you're going to have to be thoughtful about it and sort of say, are you going to be part of the solution and try to help fight this battle? Or are you going to sit there and say, it's all about me and how wonderful I am. And I'll protect my family and I'll put a wall of garden around him and try to do what I can. Go ahead. You're up. Go ahead. Uh, you, you said people who are more informed. I'm, I'm curious if it, are they more informed or more involved? Are they oh. more more the people who have a stake in this going forward, or people who are just going to be affected? Because if that, if everybody doesn't have a stake in this, I you know I'm I'm really worried. I, I agree. Everybody should have a stake in it, but everybody's not going to profit from this. And that's what I mean by everybody so having a stake. That's a great question. Is there information reliable? Okay, so here is, I'd like to answer it. First of all, just to uh, answer Deborah's point, I guess, a little bit. I do feel that for me personally, it is very important to have jobs. That's the main reason we're here. But I also personally, I think a lot of you are, I'm just curious about the future, and I feel like learning new information is great, and it's just exciting. And that's the other reason I would like to do this. So. Um, this is some speculation here, but it is informed that it's just exciting to think about the future. David, so there are people who are informed, usually for the people who are informed about this area, they have to be involved. And it seems like we don't really know what Google is doing, they just seem to be, we don't know. There are some folks, uh, Ben Gertzer is the one I'd like to mention, and I should like to name the board. He has an open AI platform called uh, Open Commenting. And he does believe that all the AI should be made available to all of us to work, you know, to chip in and make it, uh, you know, as a utility, so to speak, instead of causing the lab. So there are a few good guys, if you will. We're trying to say, us. let's get it out of the lab so we can play with it no more. We're playing with here. Is yeah. it dynamite or is it just a very interesting technology? It's, not going it's a wave of information. It's overwhelming. You have to get into it and start paying attention and start discriminating uh, from all the flood about robots and AIs and everything else, what is actually valuable. Uh, so it takes some research, but I think I have pinpointed a few people who seem to be on. Ray Kurzweil doesn't seem so concerned about jobs as I think our group is, but he seems to be pretty on as far as the predictions he's making. And so the next slide I had here was, is the AGI a friend or a foe, or will it be? So we don't have an AGI yet, um, but when it arrives, will it be a friend or a foe? And as you can see here, a lot of big minds have very different opinions about it. Stephen Hawking is very alarmist about it, which is very funny to me because, as you know, he actually benefits from it. I'm sorry? He, he was, he's the most influential contemporary physicist to have studied black holes. And he also is very reliant on AI technology because he has, I forgot the name of the, he has a disease, right? Elon Musk is also more of an alarmist type, so he thinks that the AIs are going to be our biggest existential threat. Um, but uh, I think I'm, I guess it's Blake said, and I have the same opinion, I'm a bit of a tech optimist. There are a lot of problems that AGIs could solve that we're not able to solve currently. Because of big, big, which are diamond, big iron will get us there. Right. Yeah. But those will be the first things that are going to be, never mind. No, Sorry. you're right. That's no. the problem. That's yeah. right. Right. They're mil be military based. Right. Yeah. Military based Absolutely. and corporate based. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. That's the problem. And Mark Minsky, who, if you haven't looked up, you should uh, consider perhaps the father of AI. Who recently passed away. He recently passed away at the age of 87 or 83. 
kids may feel grateful. We will not want to hear it there. Well, yes, they will, but they will be our children. So this is a more, you know, friendly and warm, I guess, view about the topic. So you can decide how you feel about AIs, I guess, for yourselves. Do you have any comments about this? Play. Well, one thing that we haven't considered here, and maybe isn't widely thought of yet, it's entirely possible that there will be no AI separate from me, separate from you, separate from you. But the AI will be within each of us. Uh, you know, we are the network of the future, possibly. And if you're half AI, and you're half AI, and you're half AI, and we're all half technological something, then no, that's one, the trans, no one is that's that's the transhumanist trans profiting. That's transhumanist. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I understand this transhumanist. In the, in the long course of this whole thing, and I, I still believe this, it, it is our fate to become a technological hybrid. We're already doing it. We wear watches. We wear everything. But it's only a matter of time before those tools are installed in our body. Now we are the AI. So it's not only are we, it's a not only are, sure. are they are our children, but, but, we are. but we are that descendant line. I understand that what's going on here is there's a couple of things you got to keep in mind for those of you who are trying to figure out the job thing, right? That AI trap is currently trapped inside the four walls because of the energy of the quiet room. The only Basic thing the, 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 the only yeah, the kind of physics, the kind of thing you got to work with, it's trapped inside four walls. It can't move beyond that uh, that wall circuit. The thing that makes this a game changer is when you read in a newspaper online somewhere that there is an extremely portable, small, lightweight, massive bowsing line. You'll notice that Toyota gave up on hybrid cars, on batteries, because the lithium battery, they believe, has no further developments that they can go through to get the levels of energy they need to make the cars that they think that they want to. So you'll notice that Elon Musk is on the other camp. He's building a giant battery factory in Nevada with Panasonic because he believes that it's going to be some form of lithium, okay, building battery back. But the point is, is that Toyota went in and they're looking at fuel cells. Because fuel cells can be made small enough to put into a watch. You inject it with hydrogen and it puts out water, but the flip side is it puts out, you know, a continuing stream of electricity as long as the anodes last. So, but that transition means that Toyota sees for cars because of the requirement to put AI in it and drive the motor and you know do the things that it needs to heat the thing, provide vibrating seats or you know heated swimming pools or whatever we're going to put in these cars. But their idea is is that that's a fuel cell world, and you'll notice that Toyota is currently testing fuel cell cars in California, and they're putting their money where their mouth is. They stopped building. Priuses that are hybrid, okay? They're uh, char pluggable hybrids, plug-in, not they're building regular hybrids, but not even plug-in. Because of this this challenge, they're trying to figure out how to get weight ratios. You notice that nobody builds a hybrid SUV, you know, big cars that carry you know, boats and all that sort of stuff, and camping gear and four kids and all that sort of stuff. So you'll notice that there, we're we're at a point, and something that will change AI is when the energy is available to take it out of our labs, okay? So I noticed the time, I cannot believe it's already 4.55. I have 55, and some of you, I think, have to be in my class, so we need to, I guess, um, I think we have a lot of other interesting questions we couldn't get to, so I will just show you our final, I have a list here of articles, um, just show you my final image. You said that this was on a blog somewhere? Uh, this is uh, um, not the slide deck, but I can make it available. It is available online, so I can make it available for you. Yeah, it's posted on SlideShare. Um, so we have more to discuss, obviously. I don't know if it warrants a third session or not. This is Amazon. Japan. This is healthcare. Healthcare in Japan. Yes. This is the very human similar to human odds like that in uh, mm -hmm. Hilton. Uh, this is, <laughs> you've seen this that one a thousand times. That's where we where are we going? So thank you for coming. Do you have any last thoughts to add to this? Or? Too short. I can't believe it. it was one and a half hours. Thank you for coming. Hope